Why don't we kick off right where Rachel and Paul left off on uh, regional banks and the banking crisis. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done in that space. And um, why don't we start with you, Eric? You have also jumped into the fray of SVB um, in the equity. So can you tell us a little bit about where and when you choose to jump in and how you think about these situations? Sure. Um, you know, bank restructurings are, are unique uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and so just zooming out for a second, you know, in any corporate restructuring, when, when we evaluate if and where to be in the capital structure, um, you know, optionality and the duration or presumed duration of the bankruptcy is, is a big factor because a lot can change over a year, two years. Right, uh, decades. In some cases, <laughs> right. And banks are, are different, right, because you get uh, crystallized, you know, if the bank is seized at a, at a moment in time and you kind of get what you get. And if you, you know, like liquidate any financial institution, um, you're probably not going to love uh, the outcome. And so um, answering your last question first, it generally doesn't pay to be early in these things because there's, there's a couple really sort of new and interesting dynamics. The first is, you know, the a move in, in the equity price of the bank um, in and of itself, whether it's because of a, a rumor, a short, whatever the reason is, that can drive deposit outflow now, which can result in a, in a bank insolvency. And so, you know, predicting that is, is in, incredibly difficult. So um, there's a difference between buying uh, debt at the bank level or at a holding company level, like in Silicon Valley Bank, where you might have other assets and, and kind of other, other recourse. So they're not, they're not all created equal, but the very long answer to your question is late <laughs> rather than, than early on these things. And so something like Silicon Valley Bank is interesting because there's a variety of assets. There's cash. There's an investment bank. There's a big venture portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and well, there may be cash. Like the, the, you know, there, there's a dispute over that, and uh, and then there's a giant tax asset, and so you know you can come up with a range of values from one to seven plus billion dollars on seven billion and change of debt. Um, there's interesting optionality there. So yeah, we do own some equity. We we are in other parts of the capital structure as well. Right. So okay, I want to go to Randy now because Marathon very quickly made 30 million in Credit Suisse bonds in the first few days before the takeover. Um, so what are you seeing now, though? Obviously, there was an opportunity then. But. And what I, that, that, that investment was, was pretty unique. And it was, and I've done a number of banking uh, workouts in my career. And I mean, a lot of times in the, in the banking investing, it's, they seem overly complicated. And there's tons of boxes and tons of entities you got to work your way through. But in that situation, I mean, it was pretty simple. We zeroed in on one entity that had pretty much all cash on its balance sheet. So it had something like $80 billion between cash and, um, and short-term government security. So it wasn't the type of paper that blew up SIVB. These were short-dated government bonds, so there wasn't any interest rate risk in them, and cash. So we weren't taking a lot of credit risk, and there was like $16 billion of bonds, and they were coming out at 80 cents on the dollar for, for debt that was due. Literally, we were buying bonds due in 45 days at you know 20 cent discounts to par on something that we saw very little risk in. So that's what we did there. Um, we zeroed in on that. But I, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunity to come out of this of this banking crisis. I mean, the, the regional banks, and Paul hit on a lot of this, and we, we've obviously, I mean, everyone in our business is studying this stuff right now. The biggest part of their loan books are these CNI loans, commercial and industrial loans, and they are the, you know, the funders of real businesses across this country. And if you look across what you're seeing come out of these, um, these loan officer surveys that the Federal Reserve puts out, um, and you listen to what banks are saying, like credit is not flowing anymore out of those banks, right? They're all right now dealing with their own liquidity and managing their own balance sheets. So like that source of capital has just been shut off. So we think it's going to create, um, you know, we've been calling for a slowdown. This is, this is probably the thing that's going to tip us over into that real economic slowdown. And, and it's, it's going to be painful, but it's also going to create a lot of, a lot of opportunity. Right. And that's a perfect spot. Holly, what are you seeing the fallout for companies 
Uh, are you seeing that yet? Yeah, well, you know, in, re in the retail sector and the consumer sector where I work, a lot of the financing is done via, you know, ABLs and FILOs, you know, these asset bases. But they're, they're large, they're syndicated facilities, and when you get beyond the agent and the first two or three big participants, you know, B of A, Wells, J.P. Morgan, what you see are regional and smaller banks are the people that take up the syndication. So if they pull back from that market, that'll mean that people who do new loans in the sectors in which I work, are, they're going to have to be prepared to hold the paper. Um, and that will have, I think, a chilling effect on a lot of this because they've only got you know, so much capacity to make and hold that paper. Yeah. Let's talk about the consumer a little bit. Um, obviously, everyone's looking at their budgets personally, professionally. Um, <laughs> how is the consumer holding up? Um, and let's go to Randy for this. And I, I think you're, you, to me, one of the things that I've been surprised by so far is how resilient the consumer's been. I mean, the consumer spending has been really strong um, despite you know the big move in rates. Um, but I think you're starting to see, I mean, we, we track a lot of data at our, at our firm and we're starting to see the cracks. So, we're seeing delinquency rates on uh, on subprime car loans. You know they had been trending like six to seven percent pre-COVID. I think they got as low as maybe two percent when that cohort of consumers was flush with cash because of all the stimulus. And I think now we're back out at seven to eight percent. So you've seen you know that that segment of the economy is now starting to uh, is now starting to struggle. And I don't think that's a great indicator for where you know for where things are headed from the consumer perspective. Right. Holly, why don't we go back to you for a moment as a retail expert. Um, tell us a bit about what you're seeing um, in that space. And I, I think all the, the bigger retailers, particularly department stores, grocery, et cetera, are really you know, revising guidance down. They're looking at flat results, you know, maybe, maybe a real negative when you factor in inflation. Um, and they're taking in, into account um, that kind of issue. Uh, you know, we are not seeing it in a large way in retail right now, but again, the places where you're going to see it are not going to be in the, in the retailers that lead their sectors. It's going to be in the two or three that sit behind them. Right. Um, then I want to go to Eric. I was trying to think of a transition from consumer to Chinese property developers. <laughs> um, but this is probably one of the riskiest uh, distress bets out there. And um, I know you're involved in oh, several no. companies, but uh, let's talk about China Evergrande um, as it's the biggest. Um, so tell us a bit about that process and, uh, and just where things stand. Yeah, um, maybe just a little high level for a second. So we started looking at the, the Chinese property space, you know, right around when Evergrande defaulted back in, uh, what was it, August of 21. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to gravitate towards large liquid um, dislocations. This is, you know, certainly that. And so directionally across kind of all the names, it's 150 billion plus of offshore paper that was either defaulting or, or near default. And so we took a look and the, um, I guess there's like two parts to it, right? There's the value piece and then there's the process piece. And the value piece, um, you know, I don't think was that big a leap of faith. I still don't think it is. You know, the developer uh, sort of universe is 25, 30% of, of the Chinese economy. And so, uh, uh, and home ownership is still the primary vehicle for, for uh, wealth creation and savings in the country. And so like, just believing that those two things kind of mattered at a high level and will continue to matter was, I, I think, all you sort of need to believe on that side of it. You know, maybe the harder part, and I was going to say, the process. To your answer okay. is, a, is a process <laughs> part. And yeah. so it's one of those things you could diligence. Like, there have been Chinese restructurings in the past, and the advisors, and um, both financial and legal, are large multinational. Uh, advisory firms and law firms that we're all very familiar with and so um, you know getting comfortable with the process um, but also wasn't that hard um, it's different right it, but it, it's there are rules and so just sort of believing that the rules would be adhered to I guess was the leap of faith so we were we were on the ad hoc in uh, in Evergrande 
and have a uh, specific investment in the scenery journey box within within Evergrande. And, and I'd say a, a few things. The pro, like there was a, 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 a sense more externally than internally that it took a really long time for Evergrande to restructure. I mean, it was like barely more than a year, like, you know, for a company that's easily as complicated as Lehman. Like how long did Lehman take? So um, that part was fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the level of disclosure that we got was shockingly uh, high. And the but what do you mean by that shockingly high? Like, well, on like you know, when you go to like a mechanic or a doctor or some things, I don't know anything about either of those, and they tell you there's a problem with your car or your body, you just kind of believe them. Mm -hmm. They could have told us that all of our real estate within our box was like on the bottom of the South China Sea, and I would have said, okay, like, I guess we're worth zero. Um, but they didn't. They took a team of 50 Deloitte accountants in there for many months, did a really in-depth project-by-project analysis, and came up with a debt sustainability model you know, that for us resulted in 129 cents of take-back paper. Um, but it was really thoughtfully done. Oh. Uh, as you have been describing that, Eric, Randy, you smiled a little. What are you thinking as uh, you're listening to this? No, I, I don't have any view on Chinese restructurings. I just thought his comment was funny about the, uh, oh, okay. the mechanic and the doctor. Okay. <laughs> Good one. Thank you. Um. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a big contrast, Aaron, to those of us who lived through the restructuring cycle in Thailand when everybody had gone through, thought they had made secured loans and discovered that there was no legal structure there back at that time to even support the enforcement of the paper that they'd put out, to then see that China in a major restructuring is actually trying to do it right is very different than and what we have seen in some of these other places. And so, like, why might that be? Um, you know, they've got uh, seven trillion of onshore corporate debt, a trillion of offshore corporate debt, 75 percent of which is maturing within the next three years. So access to foreign capital probably something that's important to, uh, to the economy, and, and I, I think they're, they're demonstrating that right now. Yeah, really interesting. Um, okay, let's jump to a completely different sector again um, and go talk about healthcare for a moment. So um, healthcare is under significant pressure, uh, as we heard a little bit already about. Um, Randy, I know you spent some time in this space, um, and you have been looking at um, some of the private equity roll-ups in that sector. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing? I mean, look, healthcare is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a classic space that we're drawn to, right? It's, I don't know, it's probably the second or third largest sector within the leveraged credit markets, so it attracts a lot of capital. And, you know, going in when these companies are healthy, the, you know, the, the par performing lenders tend to like them because they're supposed to have pretty sustainable, you know, recurring cash flows, but something usually goes wrong, whether it be some type of regulation or some type of litigation or somebody loses a contract and it creates some really good opportunities. So as we're kind of thinking about right now, where would we want to deploy some capital? You know, and I think Paul hit on this a little bit when he spoke, a lot of these healthcare companies, you, you read about it every day, there's major or there was at least major uh, wage pressure and labor shortages. So from everything from hospitals to some of the service providers to physical therapy, um, you know, there, there's been a shortage of labor and that labor's been very expensive. And so one of the things that the, you know, the Fed pumping the brakes on the economy will hopefully slow down the labor market and create a lot of slack there. So that'll create opportunity for these companies to staff up and bring their labor costs down. And they're, they're good, th these are good industries, right? They generally have good favorable tailwinds because you've got an aging population, you've got a growing population, You've got, you know, the, some of the things we've invested in historically have benefited from, you know, there's been a lot of growth in the diabetic population, a lot of growth in the obese population, and all that stuff drives a lot of volume into the healthcare services space. So it's a big area of focus for us. So is, um, so is pharma, because again, it's, it's pretty defensive. Um, and there's always something that happens that creates, you know, somebody loses a patent, it creates opportunity. So we're looking right now uh, very closely at a lot of the services names. There's some opportunities in the staffing uh, space where there's been some pretty big private equity uh, roll-ups. So, um, and there's some real good businesses there. And 
Now's the opportunity where you can create them at attractive valuations, given everything that we just discussed. Right, yeah. Holly, you were nodding when um, Randy was talking about um, it's obvious that, you know, something always seems to go wrong. Can you talk a little bit about that? Even it seems yeah, so. It's just, it, when you hear private equity roll ups, automatically you should be going, okay, so what could go wrong? Because a lot goes wrong. You know, we saw this happen in long term care facilities, huge restructurings, because the idea was that, well, we can combine them all and we can combine the back office services and we have you know purchasing power and we can drive these costs out etc however they didn't take into account the fact that every state you know and practically every county had a different reimbursement policy a different medicaid policy you know etc and they ran afoul of all of that so now we're doing radiology practices we're doing vet offices our vet our personal vet was just bought you know um, and you know, and they're doing dental offices, and they're doing all this. But the question is, where does the economy, the actual structural economics, come from? You know, how do you actually take, you know, this practice, this practice, this practice that we're making this amount of money, and make them make more money? While you're, by the way, guaranteeing a payout through leverage to the doctor who sold the practice. And that doctor is counting on staying on and getting paid a guarantee, if not also an earn out. So just you have to run the numbers and then you have to think about it and go, yeah, not so likely to work. Right. Um, we have a few minutes left, but I want to just run down the line here. What is the most surprising opportunity that you have looked at in recent months? And uh, what can you tell us about it? I'll <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's an opportunity, but it, it's a dynamic, I, I, I'd say, that I'm surprised by, which sort of goes uh, and it dovetails a little bit with the consumer conversation, which is the strength and tenacity of retail investors, particularly with respect to near and near bankrupt uh, equity, uh, has, is sort of a new factor in and around bankruptcy um, that I thought would have gone away, you know, with AMC, with Hertz, AMC, and it's not. Like, it's a, it's a, um, it's a real consideration uh, that, it, that has kept, you know, at least one company, I'm talking about AMC, out of bankruptcy, um, and it's, it certainly changed the way uh, we evaluate, uh, you know, a lot of companies that have what I'd say are highly volatile equities in and around the sphere of insolvency. Yeah. Interesting. Holly, what about you? You know, we're, we're all about disruption right now. There's, there are tons of disruptive forces going on in segments of, major segments of the economy that ultimately end up in the consumer's hands. And, you know, I can talk about retail afternoon, but I'm not going to. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about automotive and talk about the EV phenomenon. And the fact that, first of all, we've seen, you know, all of these new EV companies, some of which are crashing and burning, et cetera. But the disruption that they create for the core automotive manufacturers, the OEMs, the dealership structures, all of those people are going to have to evolve how it is that they operate to take into account the fact that states are mandating, I mean, you've seen the California mandate with regard to cars, and uh, how this is really moving at a very, very rapid pace, and it's going to cause substantial disruption in all sectors of the automotive industry, mm -hmm. um, driven by both consumer design and regulation. Okay. Um, and that's, I think, a very, very interesting space when you consider the outflows of that, that very disruptive force. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think what Randy. I'm probably the, probably the most surprised by is just the strength of the housing market as well. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the consumer. But, I mean, if you would have told me, you know, I would have thought with uh, mortgage rates moving probably 300, 400 basis points that home prices would have been under pressure, um, and they haven't really come off at all. Maybe home prices are down 5% or something in the last year, and I think that there's, it's probably because there's a structural shortage of, uh, of, of, of supply in that market, which that to me was a, was a big surprise to see it. I would have thought housing would have been down a lot harder in this environment. 
Um, and then I do want to, uh, we're talking about opportunities, of course, but sometimes it's about spotting the risks so you know what is a bad opportunity or, or vice versa. Um, Eric, can we start with you? What do you think is a huge risk that's been often overlooked? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not going to get into to single single name shorts, but but I do think um, in and around kind of retail and old brick and mortar retail specifically, um, there are uh, you know, one or two kind of large. Uh, companies within our sphere that, you know, they're not going to default tomorrow, but it's sort of hard to imagine them are earning their way back into a, a sustainable cap structure. And then I can turn to you. These are very difficult businesses to restructure at, at the end of the day and, and generally liquidate. So they're interesting shorts because a lot of the time you're, you're you know, you're, even on the credit side, you're playing for, for zero. Holly, what about you? A big risk that's overlooked? Um, consumer products and brands. We've had all sorts of, again, disruption in companies buying brands, rolling them up. Again, roll up. That should be a warning. Anybody hears the term roll up in any kind of strategy, you should take a hard look. Um, um, but in general, it's, what is the value of, of a brand in today's economy with today's consumer? Um, is it really have the kind of value that it had before? Um, there's going to be, you know, there's, there's super competitive pressure among many of the consumer brands. Um, that doesn't bode well for margins. It doesn't bode well for earnings. And in a down economy, as the consumer, you know, trades to house brands, um, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, displacement in uh, those segments. And Randy, what about you? I, just say, I think it just goes back to sort of how fragile some of these banks still are. I mean, you see, sitting there, you see a headline come up that so-and-so bank is going to put themselves up for sale, and next thing you know, their stock's down 50%, and their bonds are down 50 points. And there's just, um, you know, a lot of these things, like the, the, the media, social media can, can have some pretty material influence. I think some of those headlines that came out last week were not real headlines, but you know, they caused a lot of panic in the, uh, in the banking system. So I think that, that isn't fully behind us. I know, like, you know, we've seen a lot of big banks go down, and the Fed has stepped in and put in place some safety nets, but I, I don't think we're totally through that, um, through that crisis yet. Right. So just very quickly, what are you preparing for this year? <laughs> I'm, 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 Just you can say one word. What are you preparing for? A wave of distress? A quiet uh, lull? We, we, we take it as it comes. I mean, <laughs> I, I've stopped trying to predict things a long time ago. We, we really just sort of yeah. play the opportunity set that's in front of us. Holly, what about you? Things. For the next few months, unfortunately, I'm liquidating a beloved major retailer that probably shouldn't be being liquidated. But you know, after that, I think there's going to be more of the same. Mm -hmm. I think we're in for a slow grind. It's going to be, the, in, the inflation's going to be pretty persistent. Maybe the Fed's done or getting close to being done raising rates, but we're going to be in this, in this low growth to no growth, sort of grind it out kind of environment where capital's going to be constrained and it's going to create um, a pretty long, um, I, I hope, a, a, a nice little runway here of sort of good distressed investing opportunities, probably starting with, with lending because a lot of companies are going to need capital and then followed up with hopefully some good secondary market um, distressed purchases. But I think we have a nice little runway here for, for the things that people like us do. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Randy, Holly, Eric. Thank you so much for being here, sharing your insights. Uh, so interesting. Um, and thank you all for your attention and being here.